At this point, all of our examples have been proofs of general statements that hold for all x or for all x and y in the real numbers. And so we're going to have a look at how to prove statements that involve existential quantifiers. For example, let's try to prove the statement there is at least one real number x that is between 0 and 1. To prove statements with existential quantifiers, we need to use a principle of logic called existential generalization. It works like this. If we want to prove a statement of the form for at least one value of x in some universe of discourse, then some statement about x, let's say p of x, we need to demonstrate that there is at least one element in that universe of discourse that satisfies the statement. And we do that simply by giving an example. And so our proof has to start by letting x equal some specific element. For example, if our universe of discourse is the real numbers, we need to start our proof by letting x be some known example of a real number. For example, we might say let x equal 1. This is a specific example of a known real number. From there, we would need to demonstrate that our statement holds for that specific number. And so instead of demonstrating generally that p of x is true for an arbitrary x, we're just demonstrating that p of 1 is true, that the statement holds for our one example of a real number. If we can do this, then we've successfully given an example of something in the real numbers that satisfies the statement, which proves there is at least one thing in the real numbers that satisfies the statement. In other words, it proves there is at least one value of x for which p of x is true. Now the principle of existential generalization might be fairly easy to understand. We're just giving an example to show that a number exists with a certain property. But in practice, it can be one of the hardest proof methods to use because it involves a little bit of creativity. What we have to do is sit down and think of an example that is going to satisfy the statement we're trying to prove. And coming up with that example can sometimes be a little bit difficult. Let's return to our proof. In this case, we're trying to prove that there is at least one real number, x, that is between 0 and 1. Using the principle of existential generalization, we need to start this proof by giving an example of a value of x that has that property. And so we need to sit down and think, can we come up with an example of a specific real number that we know is between 0 and 1? One obvious choice might be the number 1 half, or in other words, the inverse of 2. And so we can start our proof by saying let x equal the inverse of 2. From here, we're going to need to demonstrate that our example satisfies the statement we're trying to prove. In other words, we have to prove that the inverse of 2 falls between 0 and 1. Let's get out a scrap piece of paper. This double inequality that says 0 is less than x is less than 1 is really just a shorthand way of expressing two inequalities. It expresses that 0 is less than x and that x is less than 1. And so if we're going to demonstrate that this holds for our example, the inverse of 2, we need to demonstrate two inequalities. We need to show that 2 inverse is greater than 0, and we'll also need to show that 2 inverse is less than 1. The fact that 2 inverse is greater than 0 is not too difficult. We've already proven in general that for every real number x, if x is positive, then the inverse of x is positive. And so if we can prove that 2 is positive, then we'll be able to conclude that so is its inverse. The reason that 2 is positive is also fairly simple. We know that 0 is less than 1, and if we add 1 to both sides of this inequality, we get 1 plus 0 on the left and 1 plus 1 on the right. This gives us 1 is less than 2. Combining that with the inequality 0 is less than 1, we can say 0 is less than 2 by transitivity. And since we've already shown that if a number is greater than 0, then its inverse is also greater than 0, we can then conclude that 2 inverse is greater than 0. Next, let's look at how we can show 2 inverse is less than 1. We've already shown that 2 is greater than 1, and we've also shown that 2 inverse is positive. This means that we can apply axiom 04 and multiply the inequality 1 is less than 2 on both sides by 2 inverse. And since 2 inverse is positive, this will preserve the direction of the inequality. We now have on the left-hand side 1 times 2 inverse, and on the right-hand side 2 times 2 inverse. By axiom m3, we know that 1 times 2 inverse is 2 inverse. And by axiom m4, we know that 2 times 2 inverse is 1. This gives us 2 inverse is less than 1. With this demonstration, let's return to our proof. Here, we've already let x equal 2 inverse. And so it's understood that we're going to be trying to demonstrate that for this value of x, x is greater than 0 and x is less than 1. 
To show that two inverse is greater than zero, again, we can start with the inequality zero is less than one and add one to both sides. This gives us the inequality one is less than two and combining that with the inequality zero is less than one, we get zero is less than two by transitivity. Appealing to the proposition we've already proven, we can say that since two is positive, so is its inverse. This proves that our value of x is greater than zero. Next, since we've already shown that one is less than two and that two inverse is positive, we can use axiom 04 to multiply two inverse on both sides. This gives us two inverse times one is less than two inverse times two, which using axioms M3 and M4 simplifies to two inverse is less than one. In other words, we've shown that our value of x is less than one. We can now conclude that for our specific value of x, zero is less than x and x is less than one. And applying the principle of existential generalization, this proves that there is at least one value of x in the real numbers that is between zero and one. Let's look at another example. In this example, we're going to prove that there is no limit to how large the real numbers can get. In other words, we're going to prove given any real number x, we can always find at least one real number y that is larger than x. Now, looking at this statement, we see that it begins with a universal quantifier, for all x in the real numbers, and so we need to introduce x as an arbitrary constant into our proof. We do this by saying, let x be an arbitrary real number. Next, we see that for this value of x, we need to demonstrate that there's at least one value of y that's larger than x. For this, we need the principle of existential generalization, and so we need to assign a specific value to y. This means we need a statement that says, let y equal something in particular. The question is, what value of y can we assign? we have to think, for this value of x, can we come up with a value of y that is larger than x? One obvious choice for this might be x plus one. With this specific value of y, we now need to demonstrate that the statement x is less than y holds. And again, this is for an arbitrary value of x, but a specific value of y. The demonstration of this is fairly simple, so I think we don't need a piece of scrap paper for this. We can start with the inequality zero is less than one, and then simply by adding x to both sides, we get x plus zero is less than x plus one. x plus zero, of course, is x, and x plus one is the value we've assigned to y. Now, since y was a specific value, the principle of existential generalization allows us to conclude that there is at least one value of y for which x is less than y. And since x was arbitrary, the principle of universal generalization allows us to conclude that this is true for all values of x.